problem is, is that his feed rate exceeded the state of the art that we have today in drag saws that use diamonds. And, and so the article is, was, was, was based on flawed logic. Now, it almost looks like the blade had a curvature to it. So, there's one way to find out if it was a curvature, and that is to put a straight edge on it. There you go. Yeah, that's really a pretty big blade to do go. that. That's probably what that hole is over there where the blade was in. Yeah. So this is Chris testing for flatness of a possible ancient cut surface. But it's actually uh, quite flat. Well, no, it's got a bit of a... The surface comes out here and then it kicks in. You've got two right cuts, in there. two different cuts there. Yeah, you've got two different cuts, yeah. It comes down to here. Actually, there's three. It ends there, right. then it steps out. There's one there, one there, and then it slips out. It appears that when they were actually placing these these basalt blocks into the table, they were they were just kind of slicing off uh, just to make them fit, just to you know have the top surfaces come together uh, and, and just knocking off little pieces here and there. That's an ancient saw cut. You can tell because here. You look at that, you can see how the surface could have been pounded by stone to get the, the surface. But here, that's clearly evidence of some kind of tool like a saw cutting through the material for the top half. This is at the Great Pyramid. And similar to Peru, what we see is different materials, uh, different forms of workmanship from crude to incredibly refined. Here again, we're going to look at another saw cut example. But this is, uh, I'm just blown away. This is the Great Pyramid of Giza. But here, have a look at this. This is an obvious saw cut. See, this is the this is the rough layer, and then this is not only flat-ish, but the, you can see where the cutter, like the saw or whatever, stopped because here is where it's broken away, and on this side too. But what blows me away is the just the number, the amount of evidence here is nuts. Oh, I know. So this is the Great Pyramid at Giza. And there, the original, what's left of the original casing stone, you can see right there. And this is just our first half an hour here. And this blows me, it completely blows me away because we've seen obvious evidence of machine cutting technology. Uh, in basalt, which would require, as far as I'm concerned, tungsten carbide or diamond tools. Uh, and that's obviously why we're, we're here with Christopher Dunn and Stephen Mailer, because Chris is the expert on technology. He works in a very modern um, establishment and has done for 50 years in terms of working with the most modern high-tech equipment for cutting materials and shaping materials. And with Stephen Mailer, we have the oral tradition based on the work of Abdel Hakim Awiyan. So with the two of them, we have a full the ability to look at the left brain and the right brain approach. Amazing stuff. I, I had no idea it would be this incredible. Pavement stones. This was purposely laid to, to level the plateau. So this is artificial stone, everything you see. Look at some of these blocks. Hakim would point to one 30 feet long rectangle weighing 200 tons. Some of these stones, so you understand, before they built anything up, they leveled the plateau. But when, this is all artificial construction. And what you're seeing along the line, you'll see holes. 
Sometimes you'll see square holes. Sometimes you'll see round holes. They originally were open to the tunnels underneath to solar energy to heat the water. According to Abdel Hakim, water is the source of the energy of the pyramids. Water. Breaking the bond from hydrogen and oxygen and water releases a tremendous amount of energy. So, so uh, and as you see, as Yusuf explained to coming up, these the lower courses of this pyramid were encased in this rose granite. All of this that's come off were the lower courses. So, did they quarry this? Of course not. They didn't take this granite. This is evidence of the cataclysm. Ah. Direct evidence of the cataclysm. These stones were weakened, fell off, and then they could come with metal chisels and attack the stones. But they could not do this. Take these off without some, some event happening. So it's not just quarry. They will tell you it's been quarried, but not. This is all event of a cataclysm. So here at the Menkara Pyramid, the casing stone, which is red granite from Aswan, brought 500 miles from the quarry, it's about two, at least two feet thick, so it's not like a thin veneer layer, it's at least two feet thick. Again, there's Khafre Pyramid in the background. A lot of knobs on these, uh, these stones on the outside, very similar to what we see in Peru. And the indigenous story is similar, again, to what we find in Peru. And that is that the the knobs there were for the tuning of the wall because this wasn't simply a functional thing. If this and these were indeed ancient power plants and vibratory structures, then it kind of makes sense that you would have to tune the, tune the exterior in order to achieve the vibration harmonic that you were after. At least that is a more, I think, logical explanation than the idea that those knobs were there to help lift the stones, because a lot of the biggest ones don't have any knobs on them. And then it's on this side, we see the little, little pyramids. You can clearly see how the entire exterior of granite has been stripped off one of these baby pyramids. Again, the coffery one here. And the whole area is strewn with the remains of cannibalization of an ancient structure in ancient areas by later people. And before you say, oh my God, isn't that awful? How could they do this? Remember, these buildings are a minimum of around 4,000 years old and could be much older. Over that period of time, cultures come, cultures go, and especially later cultures who arrive and have no comprehension as to the significance of the original constructions. They look at these things as simply quarries. You don't only find that in Egypt, you find that in Peru and throughout the Middle East, I'm sure, in many places in the world. So the Great Pyramid in the background here on the Giza Plateau, and you see this is the solid uh, bedrock, sandstone. Most likely these are uh, crypts or caves carved into the bedrock itself. And what this looks like is a little pyramid and what you see on the right hand side, you see how the uh, shaped sandstone blocks interlock with the original bedrock itself. Because you see all of these indentations here made so that the blocks would fit in. Like they're trying to lock in a three dimensional way the stone, introduced stone, with the bedrock itself, and that of course makes the structure a lot stronger. And where we're heading now is towards the Sphinx and Sphinx 
temple. I made a mistake, that's not the Great Pyramid, that's uh, Menkara, because here we have the second pyramid in the background, Khafre, and the Khufu one, the big one, great one here. And with the limestone, you can see that uh, there's no real obvious evidence of mortar in between the limestone blocks. Limestone's not that hard a stone, relatively, but it's a lot harder than these piles of adobe. And the bottom line, of course, is the fact that the oldest construction is the finest. And where we find lack of mortar or cement-like material to glue the stones together, that is the oldest. The newer stuff, as in 2,000 years old, that's where you find mortar. Much more difficult to construct a building without mortar than with, because the stones have to fit perfectly in place. How's that for a view in the background? This is inside the Sphinx Temple, and this block of gray-black granite is perfectly vertically level. And it's similar to some of the stuff we see in Peru, because you see the corners, a lot of the stones are rounded over like that for strength. This is all basically red granite. Perfectly level. And you can see the weathering at the bottom that looks like that would have been the result of water. But uh, we had Chris Dunn here with his gauge which is accurate over one foot to within one ten thousandth of an inch and this surface was that flat. This is only a preliminary look at the Sphinx Temple because we will be coming back. We have to kind of race through today. But here too, even with the weathered surface, you can see half of a degree off of level. That's because of the, the it looks like water weathering. Here, 0.2 degrees off of being perfectly level. So for those of you who uh, may never get a chance to come to Egypt, this gives you a brief look into the Sphinx Temple. This is one of the pits. Could have actually been one of the water water channels because the thing is that the whole Sphinx or the whole Giza complex is filled with tunnels, horizontal and vertical tunnels that were probably what were used to conduct water uh, in ancient times when the pyramids were the energy generating things that they were. So, stay tuned for future uh, updates as we progress through this journey, but unfortunately we're always racing, we have to race through some of these on our first day in order to get a brief look at uh, what some of this stuff looks like. Sphinx! Interesting graffiti covered stone wall. How about the fact that you're actually looking at the Great Sphinx of Egypt? What we now know, thanks to the work of Dr. Robert Schock, John Anthony West, Graham Hancock, and others, is the fact that the Sphinx has been shown to be older than any pharaoh, at least two or three thousand years older 
than the first known pharaoh. So we're looking at a pre-dynastic, pre-pharaonic construction. This, of course, is repair work. And the Sphinx has been repaired over and over and over again. It's even been written that the Sphinx was being repaired during the time of Khufu and Khafre, the pharaohs supposedly responsible for the giant pyramids behind the Sphinx, but water erosion, as based on the work of Dr. Robert Schock, as shown here in the Sphinx enclosure, it's water erosion that caused the necessity to repair the Sphinx. The head is not original. It was recarved at least once. And what most people don't know is that the Sphinx was originally simply the head exposed above the plane of sandstone. It was dug out to create the shape of the body. But it wasn't dug out with a bunch of adzes, shovels, and chisels. Cubes were taken out. Giant cubes which wound up being converted into the Sphinx Temple and possibly also the Valley Temple nearby. Okay, we're now going to discuss the erosion on the Sphinx and we have to give credit to the great Dr. Robert Schock from Boston University who first was brought here by John Anthony West in the early 90s and did a detailed study of the erosion of the Sphinx it was featured in a NBC special, Mysteries of the Sphinx which was nominated for two Emmys and won an Emmy for Best Original Screenplay. As Dr. Schock explains, Limestone is sedimentary rock, forms in sediments under the ocean. It's called nummulitic limestone, it has little seashells, nummulites. So it does not form uniform. Limestone falls heterogeneous, not homogeneous. Meaning you could have a hard layer, soft layer, harder layer, soft layer, harder layer, hard layers, harder layer. So what he found is the particular erosion that we see here, some of the hardest layers, he actually mapped the whole stratigraphy of this side, each layer and its hardness and its, and its durability. So what he found was some of the hardest layers of deposition are the most eroded. So he concluded that it would take rainfall beating at an angle for thousands of years to do this. Not a flash flood, not a flash rainfall. Take steady rainfall for thousands and thousands of years. The hardest erosion layers are eroded. And it has this particular rounded surface, which Dr. Schock says is classic water erosion, not wind and sand, which we can see in the Fourth Dynasty tombs, cut away, eaten away by the sand. This rolling, rounded is clearly water erosion, and clearly cannot be because of climatic conditions less than eight to 10,000 years that the climate was here to cause that type of rainfall. That's his conservative estimate. We say well over 10,000 years. Hakim placed the date of the Sphinx at 54,000 years. What also Dr. Schock found was the erosion in the front of the Sphinx was eight feet deep. The erosion layer in the back of the Sphinx was four feet deep. Not, not all constructed at the same time. First was the head and the four legs, then the body and the tail much, much later, thousands of years later. So she's not done it all at the same time, but that the, obviously the head was done first. And also he concluded that the top layer that you can see was the actual ground level of the plateau, only what was now the head would have been sticking out, it would have been just a limestone outcropping originally what she called a yardang, only the head. And so the head is out of proportion, we know she's been carved back many, many times. According to Hakim's tradition, the original head of the Sphinx was like Sechmet or Tefnut, if we see her in images, a lioness-human combination. I believe it's been recarved back by who was called Menes Men Aha, carved it in the face of his mother, black African woman. But clearly the erosion is the smoking gun. This cannot be caused by wind and sand. This is classic water erosion, at least 10,000 years old. Inside the Great Pyramid. This is known as the robber's entrance. It was uh, by the son of the Caliph of Baghdad, Muhammad al-Mamun, in 810 AD. 
and we're going to the ascending passageway, which is the original structure. Right on. Oh, yeah, and he woke up late. Well, that's just myself. 50 feet. Okay. Which will give you practice for doing it. <laughs> Gee, thanks a lot. <laughs> Inside the Great Pyramid. And we are going down into. No? The subterranean chamber is padlocked. Ask Yusuf, though. It might supposed to be open. Okay. Wait till Yusuf comes. Okay. Let's see, send the. This is the original entrance, this is the ascending passage, and we're hoping we're going to get a key open for the descending passage. So the, uh, the subterranean chamber has been padlocked even though the, uh, we had permission to enter, there's a lock on it, so instead we're climbing up into the Queen's Chamber. Okay, this is the Grand Gallery inside the Great Pyramid at Giza. You see the uh, projections uh, or the uh, yeah, projections. Almost saw like pattern of the walls tapering as it goes upwards. Okay, the groups we see here is obviously not made for decoration. Uh -huh. It's made to, to be effective and affect the sound resonance. Uh -huh. We can see here how these stones are housed like puzzle pieces because this was what we know as the resonance filter. The vibration here was so powerful. Uh -huh. that if these things were not attached together in that very fine way, they would be dismantling immediately. Well, once the resonance is activated, let me activate it from here and press it from the other side. Is that a knob or is that just Whoa. me? There's a knob there. Is that you doing that? Yeah. Bloody hell. you can hear the incredible sonic vibrational experience that this is. This is, that low sound is Yusuf by himself creating that amazing resonance. This is one of the baffles just before getting into the king, so-called King's Chamber in the Great Pyramid at Giza. So well, this is the actual entrance into the King's Chamber. A bunch of people in, are in here. Eyes of this. the box, which is solid granite.
Hey, I am now. I am now inside the box in the king's chamber. And there's no way you can understand the experience of being in here unless you've actually been in here because the sound is so complex and so incredible and how somebody could possibly think that this was constructed as a tomb and not as a acoustical vibrational device I don't understand but this is a, a childhood dream come true to actually be lying down inside this incredible granite box in the king's chamber on the Giza Plateau in Egypt. That's amazing. We've been able to secure the Great Pyramid for two hours for our group thanks to the Kemet School www.kemetology.com Now we're entering Queen's Chamber, the, this passage is only a little over three feet high. Solid rock, solid limestone, and the walls are incredibly straight. Definitely an engineering marvel. And some theorize, and I believe, too, the Great Pyramid was a massive machine that created electricity, created energy. This is one of the shafts in the Queen's Chamber. One on this side. one on the opposite side. We can see evidence, some kind of buildup of material of this black. It's probably not uh, smoke from the fire of the builders, but something else, maybe a chemical reaction that went horribly awry in the Queen's Chamber. Now we're heading back through. The causeway, or whatever you want to call it, that connects the Queen's Chamber back up yes, sir. with the main yes. entrance. Pass Ernie, how are you going, mate? <laughs> good, I'm good. Good, good I am. Hello. Hello. Ernie's from Australia. Everybody in Australia, how the hell are you? Heading out. Mustafa. Mustafa. He's not in there. And to Mustafa. the descending passage, which is here. Okay, maybe halfway down now, or a third of the way down, the descending passage into the subterranean chamber. Not as tough so far as I thought it would be. The, I thought the roof would be, uh, or ceiling would be a lot lower, but uh, anyway, onwards we... Okay, all the way down now at the bottom of the subterranean chamber. Now I'm sure you're thinking, gee, that didn't take very long. Well, it's because I turned the camera off. It's uh, several hundred feet down, but it's an incredibly straight line. Uh, and then this way, this is where it's going to get tougher. This is hands and knees in the sand for about 30 feet maybe. But then it looks like that is the subterranean chamber. So let's see what it looks like. Hey John, this is the entrance into the subterranean chamber. I'll try to do some measurements after we get a very rough estimate of what it is we're looking at. This is where the floor drops down and there is a square shaft in here that at the present looks like it drops about um, 
15 feet, and then it's filled with sand. And on the wall directly opposite of the entrance here, we have another shaft. And this goes on seemingly for an incredibly long distance. I might check it afterwards and see if it, uh, if it turns to the right about there. But your thing of interest is up here. So this is the channel thing walkway up. And there are a number of knob-like projections using a foot for scale here. And then this side, I think this is what you're interested in. Unfortunately, all the light bulbs are gone. Uh, it's a pretty rough, rough surface. I'll do in steps out from the wall here again the entrance is over there and that, I'm in the almost opposite corner so I'll do steps my foot is about a foot so one Eighteen feet to the point where um, it drops off. It's like a double step from the ground up to this level and then up to this level where it goes across to there. So 18 feet plus one, two, three, about four feet, the first step, and then a drop down there of about three feet. It approximately fills half the room. Uh, we don't have a long tape measure. But anyway, um, try, to get, uh, try to get some pictures. This is the inside of, the, of this uh, projection thing on the, in the corner opposite the entrance. With a, quite an interesting blob in the middle and then the wall is here and then this is where it starts uh, it's approximately again I'll get measurements hopefully it's approximately uh, two and a half feet from the wall so having just descended the descending passage into the subterranean chamber. Uh, we walk out through the cavern that was created by the Turks, I think, by blowing it up. And that was our visit to the incredible here. This is the Ramesseum, obviously named after Ramses. This is where you get the sense of scale, though. An important point that Stephen Mailer pointed out is if you look at the carvings on the left, they're different from the carvings on the right. Carvings on the left may be older. The carvings on the right are deeper, and they were most likely done for Ramses because there was a tendency during certain periods to deface the names of older uh, so-called pharaohs. And so Ramses wanted to make sure, or his priest maybe wanted to make sure, that his name and all the writings about him were kept almost forever. And it would be very difficult to deface something that was so deeply cut into the stone like this.
Now we don't see so far any sign of lost ancient technology or super ancient work. This is all limestone and again according to Stephen and others limestone was the preferred material afterwards because limestone was softer. You could work it with bronze chisels and stone hammers but when it comes to carvings or buildings which were made of granite, basalt or quartz, calcite, that requires tools that are harder than bronze. The question is what tools were they? In the archaeological record there are no tools as far as I know other than bronze chisels and stone hammers. So the harder stone is hinting at us that the work that work that was done is older than the pharaonic dynastic Egyptians. And like at any ancient site, you see different time periods existing. This, according to Yusuf Awiyan, is dynastic period. Again, they were working with limestone. Limestone is not very hard, so they could work it with bronze chisels and stone hammers. But these sculptures are granite. Granite is much harder, could not be properly shaped, especially not fine detail with bronze chisel, stone hammers, and sandpaper. And possibly even more curious are the presence of the keystone cuts, which we find in different parts of the world, but they're most famous here and also in Peru and Bolivia. Keystone cuts for uh, bronze or some kind of metal would be put in there supposedly to hold the stones together. But what you'll notice about these ones is you can see the tools that were used, chisels. So these are not especially sophisticated examples of them, but they're present nonetheless. So in terms of a sense of scale, again, this is the statue, or part of the statue. This is part of his head and his ear, and then coming down that way, his shoulder. 1,000 tons finished, one block of stone. Originally, of course, it would have been much more than a thousand tons because it would have been a rough piece to start with. Put your back into it. Stop my caram. Wow. And here you can see after it fell, it's the result of an earthquake, supposedly, somebody came along. And this is his head, and it attempted to separate a section as building material, and of course they gave up because this is rose granite, super hard stone. So here's the, the bottom of part of the 1,000 ton statue, and I believe this is the base on which he uh, stood and just the size of his feet is my hand in comparison. Or one foot compared to a foot. My foot's about the size of his toenail. So again, finished at a thousand tons. 
So how did they move it 500 miles from the quarry at Aswan? Most, if not all, of the rose granite came from the Aswan quarry. And so how was it moved? How do you move a thousand tons? You're not obviously going to move it on rollers across a desert. You're not going to be able to build a reed boat big enough, strong enough to, to be able to carry a finished sculpture at a thousand tons. And if, 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 uh, if it was brought here raw, as a raw blank stone prior to carving, then you're talking at least 1,200 tons, maybe 1,300 tons. How would they have moved it? So here's the the bottom of part of the 1,000 ton statue. And I believe this is the base on which he uh, stood and just the size of his feet. Here's my hand in comparison. Or one foot compared to a foot. My foot's about the size of his toenail. So again, finished at a thousand tons. So how did they move it? 500 miles from the quarry at Aswan. Most, if not all, of the rose granite came from the Aswan quarry. And so how was it moved? How do you move a thousand tons? You're not obviously going to move it on rollers across a desert. You're not going to be able to build a reed boat big enough, strong enough to, to be able to carry a finished sculpture at a thousand tons. And if, 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 uh, if it was brought here raw, as a raw blank stone prior to carving, then you're talking at least 1,200 tons, maybe 1,300 tons. How would they have moved it? Another point to take into account here at the Ramesseum is here we have limestone, which is not a particularly hard stone, but these columns, as vast as they are, uh, at least 20 feet high, you clearly see that they were done in sections. As you can see the seam as we go down, where the fill-in repair work is. So during dynastic times when this was built, they were working with limestone and working it in sections. But as we go farther back in time to the pre-dynastic period, when they're working with granite, diorite and basalt, quite often that's megalithic, that's a single block of stone, sometimes a single column, a single header piece of stone of larger scale. So it's not simply the hardness of the stone that was used prior to dynastic times, but it's the size of the stone as well. And the question is how did they move this stuff? Slaves? No. These are the colossi of Memnon. They are at least 30 feet tall. And originally were one piece of stone. This was one solid block of rock on top of a uh, monster's base. Now the thing is that just because there are hieroglyphics on them, it doesn't necessarily mean that the hieroglyphics were done at the same time that the carving shaping of these massive uh, sculptures were done. So to date the colossi based upon the, um, the hieroglyphics that are on them could be very well an erroneous thing. I think they're far older. I think these are from the pre-dynastic Comitian period.
and God knows how they move the damn things hundreds of tons if not more but I'll have to find out exactly how much they originally weighed. So you're looking at Luxor Temple or a very small part of it here. The sound in the background is a mosque and this is one of the faces reputed to be Ramses II, that engineer Chris Dunn believes was done with ancient high technology because he's found what he believes are machine tool marks inside the nostrils and cutters. He's found the actual machine tool marks on the face because the precision of this sculpture is so fine that one side is a mirror image of the other side. And right next to this head of Ramses is an incredible obelisk. It's at least eight feet on one side at the base and I have no idea. It's got to be 60 feet tall. Made of rose granite brought from the quarry at Aswan. So these rose granite sculptures which have to be 15 feet tall. That cartouche here was added later. The name of Ramses was put that after. So it's likely that this does not, the sculpture does not represent Ramses. It could be a lot older. And what Yusuf Awian pointed out is the first one has the cartouche there. The second one has the cartouche there. The third one does it? So you see, there's the cartouche with his name on it. Next to it is a dagger, but here the dagger's in the way of where it would be. So that's another sign of a great possibility that the hieroglyph does not name the original sculpture itself that was added afterwards and possibly long after the carving was done. Copper chisels and stone hammers cannot achieve 